Get your Bibles out in Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. Why you turn to Matthew 14 before you stand? I, uh, I heard about this guy that applied for a job as an insurance salesman. With a full request of prior experience, he wrote a lifeguard. That was it. Nothing else. They said, we're looking for somebody who can not only sell insurance, but can sell himself as well. Said the hiring manager, how does working as a lifeguard pertain to salesmanship? My friend replied, I can't swim. <laughs> Some of y'all got that, yeah. I can't swim and I got to sell myself as a lifeguard. It's a new book. I thought it was a new book. Actually, it may not be. Maybe it's just a repeat. You know, some of those books you throw away. I meant to call on y'all guys this week. <laughs> that one puts away. That's a thinking joke. I didn't say stinking joke. Thinking joke. <laughs> Amen. God is so good to us. All the time. Tuesday night, if you did not get a chance to be here, Tuesday night was absolutely awesome. Not only did we have it here, but at Mallard Creek, we did it at Mallard Creek on Thursday. And again, it just, it, it's really awesome. It's a way to find peace in this craziness that we live in. It's a way to, to um, show the way it's called, actually it's called mindfulness based cognitive behavioral therapy. Make it quick, short, sweet to the point. Change the way you think, change the way you live. That's it. Change the way you think. Change the way you live. And so, uh, last week we started out explaining uh, this concept uh, of mindfulness, Christian mindfulness. And this week we're going to start putting more Bible into it. We put Bible into it last week, but not quite as much. We're going to put more Bible into it this week. We learn breathing exercises. That's going to be our centering point all the time. It's the breathing exercises are your centering point. That's why it gets you on your sheet ready. And this week we're going to do something called body scan. So we're going to learn about body scan. And again, it's something to get your mind off of everything around you and get your mind on what God's doing for you, inside of you. We, we had some new people here on Tuesday night, and, and I hope that they come back and bring more with them. But if you get a chance, uh, again, if you get a chance, come on out because you won't regret it. It's, it's really, really, really awesome. I was at, I just stopped in Walmart. I was picking up some, uh, or talk, bringing back something that was defective, and I was bringing it back. There was a person sitting in there who was a, a health coach, and they were talking to somebody, and I said, yeah, that kind of reminds me of what we're doing at church, and I started explaining it to them, and they said, wow, maybe I'll go check that out, because that sounds absolutely awesome. I said, it is. It keeps you, keeps you focused. It keeps your mind centered, and, and God can talk to you. So this week coming up, we're going to talk about Moses. And how God did something in Moses' life and changed his entire life. Amen? So, here you go. you got your Bibles turned to Matthew 14. Stand for the reading of the Word. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I'm pretty sure there's somebody in here that in the last... In the last can you turn on some lights up here? There they are. They are on. Look at it. I just didn't see them. <laughs> it must have been too, too bright. Amen. Uh, uh, when the bottom drops out in your life. Anybody here had the bottom drop out in your life lately? Amen. You've had some things happen that you wish hadn't happened, or when the things happened, you weren't sure exactly if you handled them correctly, and right now you find yourself actually having to, to deal with some things that you wish you wouldn't have had to deal with because you did not handle it correctly. You turned them off. Good Lord. <laughs> That's close encounters of the third kind right there. Okay. Okay, so here we go. Uh, uh, Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. Now you got to understand something. This, this, let me give you a little preface on this thing. This, this is quite an amazing day for these apostles. They're seeing some amazing things happen. They just saw 5,000 men plus women and children, probably 15,000, 20,000 people, fed with five loaves and two fishes. They know that God can do anything. And they've seen all this stuff with their eyes, but they have not incorporated it in their spirit yet. Some of us, we see things in our eyes, we see it with our mind, but we haven't incorporated it in our spirit yet because we haven't incorporated it. What God does is God, when he 
he teaches a lesson, he comes behind the lesson with a test. The test is there to actually, well, I don't, I don't want to get too far into it because I, I, I just want to, we'll go into it as we get going. But this is a two-parter, maybe, maybe a three-parter, but, but it's important that you understand that everybody in their life has times when the bottom drops out. But you've got to look at the time when the bottom drops out in order to be able to get focus on what God is doing in your life. So here it is. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. You got your Bible? Say amen. Amen. You don't say on me? <laughs> All right. Look in front of you. There's Bibles right in front of you, too. Supposedly. Verse 22 is straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. Now see, see Jesus is up there praying. Y'all say Jesus is on the mountain praying. Jesus is on the mountain praying. Okay. But the ship was now tossed in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And actually in some of these words in the Greek, these are torrential rains and torrential wind, even to the point of beyond uh, major gale force winds. So this is some heavy duty stuff. This is in your garden variety, a little breeze. This is some heavy duty stuff. And you got experienced fishermen who are used to rough seas and they can't handle it. And in the fourth watch of the night, or whatever, in the middle of the morning, in the middle of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. Now remember, he put them in there while it was light. Now this is in the middle of the night now. And when Jesus saw them, and when the disciples, or excuse me, and in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And of course the actual Greek is, he says, Have courage, I am. Let me stop for just a second and sink in. Have courage, because I am. Wow. He used his name of deity. It wasn't just, I'm here, y'all. Deity. He's walking on the water. The same thing as bringing them down, he's walking on. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, you know you can't do that. You know it's impossible. You know the other church members tried that years ago. The other church down the road tried that years ago. It's not going to work. You know it's never going to work. Why you want to try to do it again? Is that what Jesus said? No. What did he say? Come. Just simply come on. Bring it on. Come on. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the men boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. Y'all say beginning. Beginning. And say so he sunk, beginning to sink. Some of us in here right now, you're not sunk, but I can tell you what. If I can look inside of you and somebody else can look inside of you right now, you're beginning to sink. Life's got you down. Life's got you hard. The storm you're in is really pushing hard. And you feel like, if I don't soon get some help, I'm going to have to put some breathing tubes in my, in my mouth because I'm not going to be able to handle it much longer. And he began to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached forth his hand, stretched forth his hand, and called him and said unto him, O thou little faith, wherefore did I doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. The wind did not cease when he touched him. The wind did not cease when Jesus picked him up. The wind did not cease until Jesus had already walked him back in the storm to the ship. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Stretch forth your hands this way. Ask God for a special anointing and touch, Father. We love you, Lord. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We know, God, that you are alive and well and on the throne, God. We trust you right now totally to handle every need in our life. God, there's so many times that we find ourselves rushed by storms. We find ourselves pushed by storms. We find ourselves up against the wall because of storms. There's times where we think everything's together and then all the bottom just seems to drop out. And when that happens... It is terrifying in our life because we not only are experiencing a small storm, but when it comes, it comes in full force, a full gale, and it racks us, and it hurts us, and we trust, Lord, today that you're going to give us hope in the middle 
of our storms. In the name of Jesus, we pray. The church said, Amen. 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 Go away now. Tell somebody that passes behind us. The future is ahead of us. God is with us. And nothing, and nothing shall be impossible. Now I tell them the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Now, now, now again, uh, let, let's just kind of look at this. I was watching. How many saw that? Uh, it was just a few. I think it was Tuesday night. We had that bad storm. It was Tuesday night because we were in the church. Uh, uh, Linda was in Raleigh, and, and, and it was 90-something degrees. And then Linda said, honey, it's 60-something 60, 60 degrees here, and, and, and it's raining so bad that the people pulled off 264 on a major highway. They were, they were going 40, 30, and 40 miles an hour. Some pulled over on the side. And I, I turned to the Weather Channel and they, on my radio and they said that it had dropped 30, 30 degrees. It was just amazing what had happened. It was 60-something degrees. And we were kind of on the outskirts of it here. And while we were in church, all of a sudden you could hear it. It went over. And I even saw it outside. I told Eddie, I said, Eddie, unless you wouldn't wash the inside of your truck, you may want to go uh, put your windows up. And so we even put his windows up. I'm glad he did because when it did, it was a downpour. I mean, it was a frog strangler. Amen? And so, so uh, uh, that storm was very violent. And when I got home, uh, my dogs had lost their ever loving mind. One had jumped up on the couch and flipped over behind the couch. It was hung behind the couch. Not hung, but behind the couch. Peeping around looking at me when I come in. And the other one went for me to sit down so he could jump in my lap. So there I was. I had these two dogs going crazy because of this bad weather. So, so again... When the bottom drops out, it causes a lot of pain. I, I remember uh, when I got home, I was talking to Linda on the phone, and, we, and when I turned to Channel 9, I think it was, and it showed what had happened that day, a, a, a hotel. It had like, I don't know, like 20 rooms, and, uh, and the tornado had come, and it showed, the surveillance camera showed the top being ripped right off the top of that uh, hotel. Just ripped it up like it was nothing. The bottom had dropped out. Natural, now this is talking about natural. Natural storms are just, you could call it a violent disturbance in the atmosphere. And when you have these violent disturbances in the atmosphere, it can cause damage to anything and anyone in its path. Even natural storms can affect us in so many different ways, but I'm going to go a little bit further, let's go a little bit deeper beyond natural storms. Sometimes even our natural storms in our lives cause such an effect on us that it hinders us, it touches us, it affects us physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. I can remember when we were living in Benson and Irene came through and, I, and, I, and, and one of my guys, my oldest member, laying in his bed and I had a teenager stand with him and his wife to take care of him. And a teenager called me and said, Pastor, I don't know what's going on, but, but, but we need some help because a tree just fell and knocked off the front porch. And I was way on the other side of I-95, and I couldn't leave. It was just such a bad I said, I can't go anywhere. I'm trying to take care of my family. I, I had a tornado go behind my house, pick up the basketball goal, and then go past my house and pick up a cedar tree and set it on top of the fellowship hall on top of it. And they go a little bit further down, shook the foundation of the church, and then tore up a house across the street. And this stuff was, was bad. And, and, and I said, you're just going to have to pray. And we're all going to pray and trust God. I said, how is Brother Donald doing? And he said, he says God's going to take care of him. And after I hung up the phone, the lights, I mean, the, the lights went out, the phones went out, and a, and a tree fell right through his bedroom and landed right in his chest and killed him. Uh, and so we had to, we, we didn't have power for two weeks. We, it was just terrible. All the things we had to go through trying to deal with even getting his funeral because there was no power. So, so again, this, 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 even though it was a physical storm, it affected everybody physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And now, now storms, even natural storms, let's talk about even some natural storms, but storms in our life. And when you come to a storm in your life, there's two origins there. The first origin is from Satan. If you take John 10 and 10, it says, The thief cometh not before to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So, let's watch this now. Watch, watch. There's two origins of storms. One is the purpose from Satan is to destroy you. Anything he does, even if he makes you feel like he gives you a little relief every now and then, 
is still only there for one thing, and that is to eventually destroy you. So, so Satan, his purpose is to destroy you, but God's is to build you up. Now, I, I think about this. I think about it all the time. I say it all the time to myself. God is always in control. Y'all say that. Always. Y'all say it. God is always in control. He's the great God, Jehovah. God always has a lesson with every storm he allows. So instead of me asking God, why did you allow this storm? I've learned to say, God, what did you want me to learn Amen. from this storm? God, what are you teaching me? Because remember, God is more concerned with your character than your comfort. Amen? Amen? God is more concerned with building you than coddling you. God knows that we have to be warriors, and to be warriors, I guarantee you that I, I've talked to men. I never actually went to boot camp myself, but I have counseled all the guys that went through boot camp, especially during the Vietnam War and World War II and the Desert Storm. And those guys told me, I, not, not, not one of them said, you know what? My drill instructor used to sit there at night and stroke our hair and make sure we had ice cream. <laughs> I never heard that. Stuff I heard, maybe, maybe, I mean, one of the guys in the Vietnam War said when he got out, when they got out of the bus at the camp, they started shooting and told them to get down. And he said they crawled on their hands and knees all the way to their barracks on the rocks. I said, why were they so rough? He said, that was nothing. He said, you know what my job was? I said, why? Well, you can see this old platoon. He said, after the battles I went through with heavy equipment, and we dug the holes, and we pushed the dead in the hole and covered them up. He said boot camp was nothing compared to the real thing. Amen. Amen? Amen. So, so, so God, instead of saying, God, why is this happening to me? Say, God, what are you preparing me for? What is the lesson in my storm? What are you trying to teach me? What? And you're, you're teaching me, but what am I trying to learn? Because God already knows what we need. Amen? So, let's, let's just look a little, get a little bit deeper uh, uh, into this lesson here. The passage speaks of uh, unstable times. Now, watch this now. They're already having problems. They, 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 they can't see. They're, they're in the middle. I've only got a couple of miles to go, but they can't go anywhere. They're stuck in the middle of a bad situation. So I say stuck. They're stuck in the middle of a bad situation. To go forward, they don't have any idea what's going to be there. They can't go back. And so here they are. Their, their vision is obscure. They can't hardly see what's going on. Their footing is definitely unsure. There's nothing to hold on to. There, <coughs> there's no security. They are stuck in this situation. Some of you right now, as I'm talking, you're going, you know what? Think about my storm. I really don't see any answers in sight. Uh, my vision is obscure. I'm, I'm trying to find a way to get my foot settled down where I can get something firm, and it's not there. And, and my security, there's no security. Everything seems to be uh, 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 insecure. And, and then you got to think about this. There, there's the ship. All of on the ship, they're going through the same thing. There's people going through the same thing you're going through. But I hate to say it, but for a lot of people, sometimes I'm that way. On you is minor surgery. On me is major surgery. Come on, y'all. That's right. Amen. I see that sometimes. I, you know, I, I, I sit there and even told. I, I remember telling somebody one time they were going through a surgery and they were getting their nose done, uh, 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 getting their septum deviated, septum fixed. I said, "You old big baby, you can handle this." And then when I went in. I made the mistake of looking at it on film first. I'd have been a whole lot better off if I hadn't looked to see what they were going to do. Amen. So, so you know what? I became the big baby. <laughs> Amen. So, so, so here you are. They're going through this. They're going through it together, but they're all having individual battles. Even like this church right now. We, we've lost a lot of people lately through death, and that hurts. But not only have we lost a lot collectively, Individually affects people different. There is no two people ever, y'all remember this, 
There is no two people that ever grieve alike. Siblings, siblings can lose their parents and they'll still grieve differently because they have a different kind of relationship. Each different, every relationship is different. Uh, I can sit back and think about my Bethany dying. And I handle it different than Linda. DC handles it different than Daniel. You know, it's just everybody's got a different relationship with these people. So, 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 so together we've lost a lot, but individually we're still going through some things. Amen? So now watch this. Here it is. The bottom is absolutely dropped out. They had two storms in one day. So I didn't read that. You might read that? Two storms in one day? Did y'all see that? You know how they had two storms in one day? Number one, the circumstances on the outside. And number two, the disruptive peace on the inside. It's possible to go through storms on the outside and be fine. Tuesday night when I'm at home, I was fine. My dogs were freaking out. I mean, I had one in my lap, one at my feet. And they, they, they're just going crazy. And I'm here going, don't y'all know God's got this? He's in control? No, that's all I can think is, Daddy, you sit where we can find you. Where we can hold your hand. Where I can get in your lap. So, so again, some of y'all can go through the things that it doesn't even bother you. It seems like others can go through the same thing and it seems like it drives them crazy. Because there's always two storms. One on the inside and one on the outside. Now, now I'm not going to I'm just going to get to the first one today. There's five things, and I'm talking about the first one today. In these storms, in these times where the bottom drops out, I'm going to tell you, it's useless. So I say useless. useless. It's useless to focus on the unsure things. Whenever I'm doing counseling with somebody and they're full of anxiety, a lot of times when they're full of anxiety, I can tell them you're looking at the wrong thing to bring peace. You are planting your foot on something that is not solid. If you try to plant your foot on something that's not solid, what's going to happen is you do not have sure footing. So to focus on unsure things, that's why I always go back to the Word. I always let the Word be my focal point. Because the word is not shaken by the storm. The word does not go down. The word does not change. God never changes. God's got this. Yeah. So, 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 again, you want fear? You want frustration? You want that hope? Then you start putting your hope in people. You start putting your hope in situations. You start putting your hope in things that honestly are not anchors. You see, it is useful. And it calms our fear when we go to the sure things. So let's just talk about some sure things. All right, now we're just going to talk about, actually, there's five in this story. We're only going to talk about one today. Y'all ready? Y'all say yes. yes. No. Maybe. Okay. Yes. All right. We got, more, we got more yeses than we did those. All right. So here we go. Number one. Bible Church is in the storm. The Lord brought them to the place of the storm. They didn't do it. God did. Somebody said, they didn't do it. God did. They didn't do it. God did. They were happy on the other side with the five brothers and two fishes. They were happy with all these people getting excited about God, Jesus doing that work. They were all excited about all this. Jesus said, no, <laughs> you've been to class, now it's time for your test. Now it's time for you to do or do what you've learned. Now it's time for you to trust what you just saw uh, uh, in your own life. And so, so immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of them to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. So, 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 so now, Jesus did this. This is not an accident. Jesus didn't go, oops. Do you think you ever hear Jesus go, oops? I don't think he does. He knew what was happening. It's not a blind move on his part. He didn't say, I sure didn't see that coming. Huh. I said it. I said the 
so many times I could write a book on I just on a book called Sure Didn't See That Coming. It'd have been a big book. Might have been a bestseller, but it'd have been a thick book. Amen. But see, Jesus knew, watch this, and this is in our own lives. You're going through that, the bottom popping out, the bottom's dropping. You're, you're, you're trying to figure out why all this is happening. God, why is this happening now? Why is it happening to us? Why is it happening this way? Why has this got to go through this way? Why are we having to go through this? The opportunity was present. That's why he stuck him in that boat. He knew that the storm was about to strike. And he knew the best way for them to learn is to put them in the middle of it. I remember, I remember uh, hearing, like, hearing my wife talk about how before she could drive the car, she'd have to go out and change the tire. They had to prove that she could change the tire, not because the tire needed to change him, but because she didn't know ahead of time that she could change that tire. So when the opportunity came, she'd be able to change that tire. I can think about things that I've done with, with people in the church, people I've done with my own kids, or things I've done where I put them in situations where it tested them and even pushed them to the limits. They're going, why are you doing this? I say, uh, you have no idea now, but one day you'll understand. Brother Hastings, he used to do that to me all the time. He, he, put, he backed me up in the corner all the time. I was so scared of that man. I'll be honest with you, I was scared to death of him. I loved him, he, but later on, I loved him dearly. And I actually called him and said, you know what? I thought you were too hard on me. And I honestly, uh, to my own self, complained to myself sometimes. Not everybody else, but to myself, uh, this man is just too hard. He expects too much out of me. I, I remember... One day, we had to go to the internship program. We had to go to different parts of the state every month at our own expense and had seminars on Friday night. It was at our own expense to stay at a hotel. We go on Friday night and be there all be there till late at night doing doing seminars and stuff and training. And then on Saturday, we would uh, have be tested uh, uh, on all the, the books that we were reading during the during the, the week and we had to read like 100 pages a day to even keep up and so all this stuff was going on and and, and then we get home on Saturday night real late all our expense and I remember uh, coming in on one one one, one Sunday Brother Hastings said how'd you do your test now I've been working swing shifts I've been working 12 12 hour shifts constantly and it had been overnight shifts and I've been working all this overtime and, I, and just some crazy mess was going on. I had some crazy mess going on with my family. So I normally made it in the, in the mid to high 90s. This day, I told myself, well, you know what, Brother Hayes, I made 87. He said, you made what? I said, I made 87. He said, really? I said, really? I said, Brother Hayes, I've been working 12-hour shifts. I've been working from all night long for the last two weeks. I can't even hardly get a chance to even read my stuff. I thought I'd done pretty good. He said, I don't want you ever to come back here and tell me you made anything less than a nine. Do you understand me? <sighs> Scare me to death. But you know what? Later on, I understood where he was coming from. So now, watch this, watch this. Look. Storms in your life reveals something. Number one, believe it or not, your storm in your life right now, say I've lost my mind, a storm in your life reveals God's great love for you. Did you know that? God loves you enough. I thought Brother Hayes was so mean to me. I said, I cannot believe this. He said, oh, by the way, uh, Saturday, I want you to come in because we got some wires we need to run. I need you to climb up under the pool pit. I need you to put wires in the floor for us and fix all these mics for us and go wire this up. I said, didn't I just tell you we're working on these 12 hour shifts? He said, didn't I just tell you I want you here Saturday? <laughs> I didn't understand that once you got in the pastorate, that was nothing compared to some of the stuff to do in the pastorate. So I said, God's great love for us. You see, see, see he knows there's some things that you can only learn in the storm. There's some things you can only learn while you're dodging bullets, while you're under fire, 
while you're being treated badly, when things are going wrong, when everything's falling out. You know, uh, the Bible even says, look, during these seasons, remember this, James 1 and 12 says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, means he makes it. He goes all the way through it. He endures temptation, for when he is tried and goes through it, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that loved him. So let me just give you six purposes. This is a, a side road. We're going to take a side road. Y'all say, here we go. Somebody say, here we go. Here we go. Side road. Six purposes for the storm in our life. Six purposes for the storm in our life. God loves us so much, he puts us through the storm. Remember, number one was, number one, this isn't the part of this, number one was, he took them to the storm. He did. Now, and why does he put us in the storm? There are six reasons. Watch this. Number one, cleansing. That's how he gets, sometimes how he gets our attention. Psalm 119, 67 says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I've kept your word. 71 says, Verse 71, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Sometimes God allows storms in our life for cleansing. You know, uh, uh, I've told this story many times. I, I was in the woods praying one Sunday afternoon for service that night. And while I was praying, it was a pretty day. Gorgeous. I'm out there about a mile from my house. I walked out there. And there was just like a little oasis in the middle of a field of, of trees. And I'm sitting there by the trees and by the ditch and I'm praying. And out of nowhere came this big strong wind. It got so strong that I got off the stump that I was on and started to climb into the woods. And the patch of woods was bigger than this room right here. I started climbing into the patch of woods. But then I watched the trees literally bend. I said, where is this coming from? And I backed back out. And I looked up. I said, God, what's going on? And just like it started, it stopped. Now, I've been praying for God to give me a message for that night. He just did. Because I heard the Spirit speak right inside of me. And he said, look back up in those trees. Before the wind came, I couldn't see the sun through those trees. After the wind, I could see the sun through the trees. Because all the dead branches and all the bad growth was taken out of the way because of the storm. And now I can see the sun again. Some of us right now, there's bad growth in our life, there's dead limbs in our life, and God allows the storm to move the dead limbs out of the way, to move the dry stuff out of the way. So, cleansing gets our attention. Secondly, companionship. The closest I think I've ever been to God is when I'm going through something. Because that's when I stop and talk to Him. You notice how we kind of forget him when everything's going good? When things get going bad, we really talk to him. Be merciful to me. Oh, God, be merciful to me. For my soul trusts in you in the shadow of your wings. I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. Psalm 57, 1. Companionship. You're more like him than you've ever been when you're going through things. Conformity. He's conforming our image. Romans 8, 29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Remember uh, last week with the grip, whatever you grip a hold of enough will change. Look, when you grip something enough, it will change your grip. He wants us to be like him. Jesus didn't have it made while he was down on the earth. Jesus didn't ride around in some limo and have all these people taking care of him. Jesus had it tough. But Jesus, it said he became poor that we can become rich. When you talk about rich now, you're talking about now rich in blessing. God wants us to be 
evil. I mean, remember, also John Cameron Swayze. Remember John Cameron Swayze? I'm going to see how much y'all, what he, what he said. There you go. He'd always say, watch this, we're going to take a Timex watch and we're going to put it in a, we're going to put it in a tire on an 18 wheel and we're going to run it 100 miles down the road. And he would look it up, it was still tick, 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 tick. He said, Timex, take a lick and then keep on ticking. He takes it today. Today, we're going to take this, we're going to top, we're going to B-52 bomber, we're going to strap it to a bomber, we're going to rob it down. And they go find it and go, look here, it's still ticking. Time X, take a licking and keep on. Amen. When he conforms us to his son, we can take a licking and keep on ticking. Amen. Now, here we go. I'm almost through, and, and, and we're going to be able to go home in just a minute. Somebody say praise God. <laughs> I'm ready for the storm to go over. Ready? Comfort. God doesn't always just do something in us, but often he does something through us. I remember going through the children's ward at the hospital in Greenville. And <clears throat> I always felt for those people. I really did. And anytime I could be a blessing and stop and pray with them, I would. But still, it didn't really hit me like it did when Daniel got sick. And when he was up there in Pippenmore Hospital in the children's ward, and they told us that they believed that he had cystic fibrosis. And they were already teaching his mom how to beat him on the back and bring up stuff out of his lungs. And, and they already said he might not live to be 17 and all this stuff was going on. And I remember praying. And I remember praying very distinctly, God, touch Daniel. Let the boy live. I was glad to take his place. And in prayer one night, the Lord spoke to me and said, you can't take his place, but don't be afraid for your son because my son already took his place. And on his first birthday, God healed that boy. It was amazing. Of course, years later, they said that they thought it was still cut, that it had repercussions and and then it may have been uh, dormant and to come back up. And I said, Daniel, I didn't believe that man. So I didn't even go in there. I didn't even go there. God's taking care of it. But I remember on his first birthday, back then they could draw on the walls. They could paint on the walls. And another cystic fibrosis patient, he was 12. He went outside of Daniel's room and painted a birthday cake about that big. But one candle. It says Daniel's first birthday. Years later, my mama was in the North Tower back then. That's where you went for the heart. And mama, they said, this is not good. She may not make it through this surgery. It's really, really bad. And, and, and I remember... How I got touched with Daniel's when Daniel was healed, and I was starting to help people a lot more through that. But even years later, I am praying for Mama, and I said, "You know what? I think I could really do better if I just go to the children's ward and pray for them, get my mind off of this." So I go to the children's ward. Daniel now is about 12. So it's been about 11, 12 years. And I walk into the children's ward to minister to the children, to the people, the parents, just whoever God had put in my way to get my mind off of mama, how sick she was. And I happened to walk by Daniel's room from 11, 12 years earlier. And on the outside of his room still was that case. And it said Daniel's first birthday. 
the Lord spoke to me. And he said, where's Daniel at now? I said, he's doing great. He says, don't you trust me with your mama? And of course, mama went through it. She went through great. But you know what? If you want to be a blessing to others, you have to be broken. A vessel that's unbroken is very limited, has very limited use. Get ready to close. Convictions. Pain solidifies your conviction that God is sufficient to take care of you. And also, storms bring about change. Paul's the greatest example of change when, he got, when God got his attention on the Damascus Road. You always heard him say they got knocked off their high horse. You know where that came from? The Apostle Paul. He got knocked off his high horse on the road to Damascus. Changed his life. I thank God for the times he got in my teaching. This morning, come on up here, Brandon. This morning, let me ask you a question. Are you beginning to sink? Is a storm around you and you feel the water up to your neck? And you're uncomfortable? And you're asking God, why? Why? Why have I got to suffer all this pain? Why have we got to go through all this? Why, God, do we have to experience this? craziest thing. I remember when I was getting my nose surgery. I go put in this little room, in this little room and they bring this bottle or a bag or something, the red stuff. I didn't even like blood. It was just red stuff. And I asked the guy that was getting ready to put it in me. I said, what is that? He made me feel really sure. He said, I don't know. He said, Dr. Alvin is wanted you to have it. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, you got to sleep back. He said, y'all guys don't like to wake up after surgery. I said, well, that's nice to know, too. He says, so he's just going to try to help you out. I said, well, the more you talk, the more you're not helping me. He says, so this is the, I'm just hoping, however he said it, I'm just thinking, would you please quit helping me? And I can remember when I was going to sleep. And I said, God, this day hasn't been right yet. Everything they've done has gone wrong. And now they're telling me this stuff I didn't know I was going to be getting and all this. I thought, God, I really am not too happy. And they put me on the table and stick my head in the hole. And, and at that moment, I heard the Holy Spirit whisper, peace. See it? Peace. I calm right down. God took care of everything. Since that time, every time I find myself going through something where the bottle dropped out, when I hear peace, I feel it. Today, your bottle may have fallen out. We're not through yet. We got more to go. Your bottom may have fallen out. Your 
trying to grab your foot, you're trying to grab a hold of something, you can't grab anything. Anything you're holding on to is not working. Last time I got this fixed, I could talk to that person, they'd help. They're not there. Last time I got like this, I could stand here. No, that's not there. Everything I'm depending on is gone. The beginning of peace is, God, not what are you trying to do to me? It's, God, what are you teaching me? What? Ask you 
why. But I ask you, what am I to learn from these trials? I trust you enough to know you're not going to allow these trials to overwhelm me. These storms will pass. And I thank you for the victory on the other side. I receive your blessings, your power, your anointing, your comfort, your cleansing right now in the name of Jesus. We give it all to you. After today, our life will be different in so many ways. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Now, now, Tuesday, part of this end of storm, Tuesday's going to help you too because it's going to help you get focused. It's all about focus. Y'all remember Mr. Miyagi wanted to tell Daniel all the time. Focus, Daniel son. Focus, Daniel son. Y'all remember that? Okay. Tuesday night's all about focus. All about focus. Because the stuff's right there in front of us. I'm going to tell you this. Remember this. Moses is, Moses is in the wilderness and he sees a great sight, a bush that's burning but not consumed. He had a choice. He could have walked right on past and tell everybody, I saw a bush burning, man, it's cool, you ought to see it. It's burning up. You know, it's awesome, but it wasn't consumed. Or he could stop and turn aside and see what was going on. Had to stop turning the side, guess what? You wouldn't have been here about Moses and the Red Sea. God's looking for us. Slow down. Turn aside. Listen to him speak. And watch what he can do in our life. Everybody happy? Yeah. And you know what? Clap your hands. <laughs> Don't say this to me. God's plans. For my future are far greater than my fears. I believe that. In the name of Jesus. Give me all I have. Brother Benny, let's go some prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to be here today. Lord, as we go forth and we put to use what we have heard here today, let us be the ones that when others see us, they will see you. In Jesus' name we pray.